It seems to carry a positive meaning, but it's kind of a weak sister of a word, nice. Consider the ways we use this word. What kind of day did you have today, dear? The response could be terrific, wonderful, exciting, engaging, challenging, even devastating, in which case it would sound like something actually happened. But if the answer is, I had a nice day, it sounds like you played in a puddle of ordinariness. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Take this scenario. You go out on a blind date with a guy or a gal. Your bestie is waiting for you when you get home to ask the question, what was he like? What was she like? If you say, oh, you know, they were nice, what would your bestie think? She would think you had a date with a runner-up to Miss Congeniality. Kind of like, well, she had a really great personality. The word nice can be devastating. I was a young pastor. We were about to have our first series of revival services in the church. I had invited my friend and seminary professor, Dr. Morris Ashcraft. He was a giant of a man. He was a penetrating preacher. I was excited for him to be there, and I was excited for our folks to hear him. <coughs> so, shortly before that week of services was to begin, I was next door giving blood at the community center and fell into conversation with one of the volunteers. Turns out she was an erstwhile member of the church, meaning she was on the books, but nobody could remember having seen her there. I told her about Dr. Ashcraft's coming and who he was and how I hoped she would be there. I'm sure she could sense the excitement I was portraying, but all she could manage to say was, well, that's nice for you. I wanted to say, seriously, that's the best you could manage, nice? We kill people and events and stories with the word nice. But do you know what? I fear that is precisely the way we approach Scripture sometimes. Take today's passage, for instance. Jesus falls into step with two would-be disciples, and they begin to talk. Well, isn't that nice? They cannot believe Jesus has been in Jerusalem, and he hasn't heard all the talk that was on the street. So they inform him. They fill him in. They bring Jesus up to speed. And our response might be, well, isn't that nice? But in fact, Jesus ends up taking them to school with the events of the week and with all the prophets had to say. He calls them foolish and slow of heart. I'm sure we could probably come up with some even better adjectives and idioms. They listened as he explained, as he expounded the scriptures to them. If we're not careful, though, we might get to this point and just say, hmm, wasn't that nice? And then Jesus agreed to stop at their house. The two invited him in. How nice. They served him supper. How nice. He prayed over the meal and broke bread for them. How nice. And then it finally occurred to them who he was. If we're not careful, we will make entirely too little out of this story. We'll file it away with other Bible stories that sound good and that maybe should mean something, but we haven't really connected with them. Yes, it's nice that the would-be disciples return from Jerusalem at the end of an excruciating day to tell that they had been with Jesus, but is that the best we can say about the story? Or if we do think there is something more to it, does nice describe what we feel? It is possible. To kill the scriptures with kindness, you know. I want to suggest an entirely different way of looking at this passage. I think we need to see it in the bright, harsh light of day. I think we need to experience it in light of the emotions of the day. We need to encounter the shock and awe of the situation. What we have is a confrontation with Jesus the intruder. In the first place, you might say Jesus intruded on their conversation, for he did. Cleopas and his friend are returning home from their Passover in celebration. Absorbed and conversing, they are suddenly joined by a third party. Jesus joined their walk and insinuated himself into their conversation. The scriptures said he came up and walked with them. 
Of course it was different back then without any public or private conveyances. You walk, they walk, he walk, she walk, everybody walk wherever you went unless you were extremely fortunate and had an animal, you simply walked. Everyone you knew walked. The world was not so big, but that you knew many of the people you were walking with. But here was a situation where two men fall in step with another whom they cannot identify. This is where we have the first piece of divine intervention. The two of them are talking and discussing, maybe even arguing, when Jesus saunters up. Given that they were probably talking about him, it's just a little odd, wouldn't you think, that they don't recognize him? But here's the reason. They were divinely prevented from recognizing him. So they treat him as they would any stranger. This is not to say that people did not intrude on other people's conversations. I'm sure it happened all the time. I've been known to do it, maybe you have too. Still, let's call it what it is. Jesus broke in. He started talking in a discussion to which he had not been invited. And when he did, he changed the dynamic of things. You need to remember that. Anytime Jesus enters our lives, our thoughts, our prayers, our conversations, he changes the dynamic of things. Second, uninvited, Jesus the intruder, as the rabbi he was, took these disciples to school. You foolish man, he said, so slow to believe, so dull, so thick-headed. I'm guessing that they may have, that may have caught their attention, even stop them in their tracks, don't you think? We like to think of Jesus as likable. Do we want to think of him as anything but likable, kind, gentle, forbearing, generous, giving, forgiving, loving, merciful? Isn't that Jesus? Well, there was that moment in the temple when he upended the money changers tables, but we're pretty sure that was a one-off. Maybe we want to believe that if that was a one-off. Um, Jesus would otherwise treat us gently, generously, with love and mercy. When, when have you imagined Jesus being in your face? But Jesus took these guys to school. He engaged in some modest name-calling. You want to hear that again? Foolish men, slow to believe, dull, thick-headed. Yeah. Did you grow up being told what nice kids do and do not do, say and do not say? For instance, you say please and thank you, and you don't call other people names. Jesus chose to engage in some name calling, and he is clearly intruding on them. He has told them that they don't know the Old Testament very well. He gave them a lesson in systematic theology, beginning with the books of Moses and going all the way through the prophets. He highlighted the passages that had to do with Messiah, passages about him. If these guys ever went to synagogue and walking home said to each other, you know, I really didn't get very much out of that service today. They couldn't say it this day. Jesus schooled them. He put everything in context. Whether they wanted him or to or not did not matter. This was Jesus' day to intrude. And then third, as a guest, Jesus intruded in their matters of hospitality and meal in their home in their home. They were good Jews. They invited Jesus to spend the night. That's what you did. The day was getting late. The invitation was theirs. The onus was on them. But when they got there, Jesus took over. Dawn's sister's late husband, Ray, was a wonderful cook. He grew up in a house of cooks. He was single well into adulthood. He knew how to cook for himself. He cooked from different nationalities. When we visited his house, he almost always was doing the cooking. He was a connoisseur, an inventor, a chef who loved to be a chef. He was an interesting person to cook for. This very droll man would come to your house and sit down at your table. You wanted to cook something special for him, and Dawn would go to great trouble. She knows how to cook. She's always known how to cook. So the meal would be served and eaten and enjoyed. And Ray, never unkind, would almost always say something like, 
you know, here's a way you could improve that dish. Uh, a little of this, cook it a little differently. Here's a good seasoning for this type of dish, as though we couldn't leave well enough alone. It was intrusive, it was and aggravating. He was almost always right. Jesus, again, is intrusive. He took over the table. He took the bread. That, that, was, that was, of course, the prerogative of the senior male to take the bread. And then he prayed over it again, the prerogative of the senior male in the household. And then he broke the bread and handed it to them. And there, suddenly, they saw him. There's no way not to see Jesus as the intruder. Now, you and I would have had better manners than this. We would have said please and thank you and excuse me. We would have done that as we passed other people on the road. We've learned to smile without inviting ourselves into other people's lives. Look at us. We're kind. We're gentle. We're unobtrusive. One of the worst things we can say about someone is that he is a bother. Had we been on the road to Emmaus, we would not have been a bother. But just maybe. We needed the intruder. How did you arrive at this point in your life without the benefit of someone else? Did you learn everything you have learned by yourself? Did you just get onto a bike one day and ride off into the sunset? Was your first effort at making a pie a great solo effort? How did you do with your first quadratic equation? We've all needed intruders in our lives. What about matters spiritual? Did you just pick up a Bible off the street corner, start reading, and get saved? Or did someone come alongside you in life's walk? Or maybe did someone blurt out at you, you know, you seriously need Jesus in your life? And because others have intruded in our lives, what is our responsibility toward others? There's no excuse for our being mean to them or for lording it over them, or for making them objects of scorn, but there is no excuse for ignoring them either. Not as individuals, not as churches, not as communities. Stanley Howard Watts and Will Willeman had this to say. The biblical story pre presents an offensive rather than a defensive posture for the church. The world and all its resources, anguish, gifts, and groaning is God's world. Jesus Christ is the greatest act of divine intrusion into the world. In the Christ, God refuses to stay in his place. The message that has sustained his people is not for themselves alone, but for the whole world. The church having significance only as God's mean of saving the whole world. The church is God's means of a major offensive against the world and for the world. God dares to intrude. So back to the beginning. You see, there's not really anything nice about this passage. Just like there's not anything nice about our praying. Spare me from the words, would you mind saying a nice little prayer? Please, we're storming the gates of heaven here. Spare me from the concept of a nice little piece of worship. We are in the presence of Almighty God, maker of heaven and earth. Spare me from the reduction of the work of Jesus. And any day, all day, open my heart to intrusion by the Savior. Jesus completely interrupted a Sunday afternoon walk. His encounter with the two absolutely turned their lives on their ears. They may have ended up driving their friends crazy with what they experienced that day. Would you please stop talking about the Jesus on the road story again? We have heard it a dozen times. I know, but from the moment it happened, I, I, I can't be still because it was such an incredible thing. I have to tell. Nothing else would ever be the same from that. Because Jesus was the intruder. So for us. Jesus wants to intrude and change our lives. Not everyone will be receptive to us or the gospel. But what are you going to do the next time someone dares to say, Oh, that's nice. <laughs>